Okay. Can you see it on the back side? Yeah, it's okay. Now, 
what we do is I'll come back to this board now. Now, when I have this HI plus plus one half summation IJ one over R IJ, this is no longer possible separation of variable is no longer possible, right? And therefore, I cannot do that. I cannot write my Hamiltonian as sum of different Hamiltonians which are which are single particle Hamiltonian, right? So let's just quickly get insight into what happens in this case by a corresponding two electron problem, which is the simplest many body problem. And even in that, I just do one center problem, helium or helium light. Right? So in that case, my Hamiltonian is minus one half del one square minus half del two square, where one and two refer to the electron, minus z over r1 minus z over r2. That is the part which is h1 plus h2 plus 1 over R12. And what I'm solving for is psi R1 R2 equals the total energy E psi R1 R2. So this whole game, I mean I don't can do mathematics or 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 computationally, but what I like you to do as students also develop a physical intuition. So that, that's, that's really what physics is all about, right? So if I were to look at this wave function, forget, forget you know, product wave function, forget all that. How would this get modified? So if 1 over Rij was not there, right? So that, does this indicate this? I would have a wave function, psi R1, R2 which is a product of R1, Y2, R2, plus I mean symmetric part which I'm, I'm not writing, I'll comment on that later, right? In this case, what you notice is that both electrons are actually should not write Y2 here as the same part, right? Both electrons are in the same orbit and therefore if I were to make a picture, right? If I were to make a picture, what I would do. So I'm trying to develop a picture in your head. You ought to be seeing the wave function in your mind when you're doing these calculations. And uh, that is very important. That's what gives you a lot of insight, right? So I have this nuclear and all this electron phi square going around. You know, last night I was dreaming I've been using green pen and blue pen and all that, and you know, that is gone out of it. <laughs> so bear with me. So right? And the other electron is also doing the same thing. Right? Other electron is doing exactly the same thing. So but that should not happen if there is this interaction picture. Right? If there's an electron electron interaction. Let us just go to the simplest thing that you had. The simplest thing was Bohr model. Let's start from there. All quantum mechanics started from here, Bohr model, for atoms, otherwise black body. Right? So I have this nucleus, right? And in Bohr model, an electron goes around the nucleus. Right? It is going around the nucleus one way or the other. And I bring in the other electron. I bring in the other electron. Where do you think it will go? What is the best position it will take? Somebody said, movie kya? Movie bata raha tha na ki dono taraf sohna jay taliya wale wajao bata hai kya hoga kusra electron. Where would the other electron go if it comes for the most stable configuration? Would it be here? 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 Where do you think is the best position for this? 
on, on the other side, right? So I have the, this nucleus, and I have an electron here in the board model, and the other electron should always go to the other side. That will make it stable, right? They're keeping as far apart as possible, right? And also, if this distance, let's say, was R1, right? Now this distance, let's say R1 prime, would be slightly greater than R1 because of the repulsion. Right? Let's try to translate this into the density picture. So if I had this electron going around, right, what I would have is now this fellow. One electron could be on this side, right? The other one would be on the other side. This is the nucleus. So I'm translating the Bohr model into wave function picture. Right? That it will be on the other side. And since I know that psi R1, R2 mod square gives me the probability where the two electrons are. Right? If that gives me the probability where two electrons are, this wave function in this case in the Bohr model or, or you know the hydrogen atom model, it was something like this. Now would have a structure which is kind of the other electron goes the way. We have two humps, if you like. Or you can say even better. So this will be a very very extreme picture which we'll come to. But for the time being, what you can say is that this being farther apart, the Z that was there has turned into a Z effective, which is slightly less than Z. So these are different ways of looking at this. All things that how interaction improves or changes the wave function. I'll take any comments or questions at this point. All this, what we are trying to develop a picture here, right? All this, when I use the technical jargon, our add terms like correlation, add terms like exchange, right? But right now, if you just ask even a 10th grade student, this is what he or she is going to say, that these electrons are going to keep far apart, right? And we, we know in the Schrodinger equation, we have to translate that, whatever the person says, into the wave function. Is, is the idea clear? And uh, let's do that now. So, now that we are at PhD level and all that, so we are going to go away from that toy model and now try to become mathematical. How do I get <coughs> this Z effective? Right? So I can say now let's try write model wave functions because I am not solving. the exact Schrodinger equation, I'm playing around with all these models, right? So if I'm playing with these models, I should be able to write my model wave function if I want to be taken seriously, if I want to solve the Schrodinger equation in a certain way or the other. So one model I can have, taking Q from here, making all these pictures, you know, we're thinking of different pictures, you know, X may be saying this, Y may be saying this, Z may be saying this, and we'll write all kinds of model wave. So one I can say that these electrons are still moving around like in a hydrogen atom, but now they see a smaller z effective. So I can still write my wave function psi r1 r2 as equal to phi r1 phi r2, except that this would now be with a z effective. So in, in a single atom, phi, single, sorry, single electron could have been e raised to minus z r with a normalization constant, which is like square root of z cubed over phi square of phi, something like that. Okay. In this system, in the 
टू इलेक्ट्रॉन सिस्टम आई एम गोइंग टू राइट दिस पाई एज सम स्क्वायर रूट ऑफ z इफेक्टिव क्यूब ओवर पाई e रेज टू माइनस z इफेक्टिव और वेर आर z इफेक्टिव इज लेस देन Is that making sense? Yeah. Can we plan so that in 10 minutes we'll have it? So in a two-electron system, z effective is, is that? Does that make sense? Or is there any comment on that? Excellent. So, yes. So the interaction part you are including in the z effective. That's right. I'm saying it's like this. You're playing with a lot of people, right? A really huge person holds you. Then suddenly a lot of people come here. They push you out. So. This force goes down, so I'm saying that effect is becoming less, right? You're still moving around with those attractions and things like those, but it is becoming less, right? Okay. Okay. So that's one model, right? The other model I can say, so that's model number one. The other model I can say is, oh, maybe you know, one electron. Stays close to the nucleus, right? And the other electron does not even penetrate; it moves in its own orbital outside, right? So that z effective is different for this and for this. And once in a while, this guy can come inside. Okay. So in terms of probability, I'll say. One electron has a probability like this. The other electron has a probability like this. So this fellow, since this electron's charge is also coming here, right? It shields it a bit, but this fellow is shielded quite a lot by this electron. Then I'll say they're actually not one z effective, but two of them. I'll write my wave function. Can I? No, I can write it still right here. So I. R1, R2. I'll write as e raised to minus z1 R1. That means the first electron is seeing is z1, and the second one sees a less z1. E raised to minus z2 R2. Except that R1 and R2 are not well defined; they are indistinguishable particles. So I have to symmetrize it. So I'll write this as plus e raised to minus z1 r2 e raised to minus z2 r1. All right? That's another model wave function. And you can kind of feel that z1 would be close to the true z, maybe slightly less because the other electron is penetrating in, right? And Z2 would be close to one, or Z minus one. Is that making sense? So I'm modeling my wave function. Better I model a wave function, better it is closer to the reality, and better the energy value. Right? I can go even further. I can say maybe this is not enough. Right? There's still some repulsion left. And therefore, if there is some repulsion left, I can even write go further and say the third model. So I R one R two is equal to this e raised to minus z one R one e raised to minus z two R two plus R1, R2 symmetric term times one, and they're still repelling. Some constant, right? Let's write this constant as a R12. So that the wave function becomes relatively larger if R12 is larger. That means if the distance between two electrons becomes larger, right? The, the, the wave function becomes larger. That probability becomes more. And if it is zero, that probability is low, and then it keeps on increasing as they go farther and farther apart. 
Okay, that's another model. Now I have to fix these, right? A, Z1, Z2, right? Or Z effective, right? And that has to be done from Schrodinger's equation. How do I do that? And these, remember, all these model wave functions, right? So model wave function. do not satisfy the Schrodinger equation because these are my model wave functions, right? They do not. So I have to find a way of how to fit them, theoretically, right? So I have to find in this case Z effective, I have to find in this case Z1, Z2, I have to find in this case this A. So there are different ways of doing it. One. By the way, whatever I'm doing right now, in DFD, all this whatever I do to a function gets transferred to functionals, right? If I say something here, whatever I do here to this wave function, I do to the functionals in DFD. So one way is to satisfy as many exact Conditions as possible. The other could be what I'll also discuss now is variation principle. The the true exact property that a wave function must satisfy is the Schrodinger equation, but it's not do that. It's not doing that. Since it is not doing this, I try to do as many as possible, right? So, for example, there are something known as the cusp conditions for 1 over r potential. You may want to satisfy that. You may want to satisfy cusp condition for electron-electron interaction, then for that fixes this, and so on, right? So you satisfy as many conditions as possible, and later we see in DFT also when you want to when you want to make better and better energy functionals. Since I do not know the exact energy functional, right? So that's like I do not know how to solve the exact Schrodinger equation. I try to satisfy as many exact conditions as possible. So a functional I'll try to construct by by satisfying as many conditions as possible. Right? And the latest one in that game is what is known as the scan functional that satisfies 17 known exact properties. All right? Before that PBE was there, that was satisfying 11. The GGA whole business started with this, uh, this, this <coughs> satisfaction of exact properties. So we'll come to that. Okay? Now, let's, so right now let me go to variational principle because that is what is going to then come are you a student here? No, so students don't do that. So that's it. Right now, I'll focus on the, the variation of this. generalize it to an, an electron wave function. In an, an, electron, an, an electron wave function, I'll include these terms, right? So that electrons keep far apart, which in the, the many electron problem is known as the Jastrow factors. Okay? And then you use those to do separately with the, the, the Monte Carlo calculations are separately in order bit. I'm just saying that right now. I'll, I'll make comment on that later. So variational principle is useful. For the ground state wave function, mainly. You can do it for excited state, but then you have to apply certain constraints. Okay? Now, what it says is that if I have a psi approximate and I calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, please stop me when you don't 
following because I understand some people in material science may be from the background of B.Tech metallurgy and all that. So just just stop and I'll explain whatever you don't understand. It has to be greater than E0, where E0 is the ground state. Okay, so as I said here, I have to either satisfy as many exact conditions as possible or apply the variation of principle. So I am trying to get an approximate wave function. Since I cannot solve the Schrodinger equation, I will construct. So you see that part is important. First, you have to know how to construct a wave function through your physical insight, right, depending on the system, right. And then once you construct the wave function, then to get these parameters, you have to then do this uh, this this minimization. Normalized. Okay. Normalized. Yeah. And, and uh, what 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 this has done is I this wave function since this gives the probability so this is always normalized. It must remain normalized. Right? Otherwise, what I can do is take an approximate wave function, make the constant in front smaller and smaller and smaller, I can go below this. So we don't is the Lagrange multiplier. Huh? Energy itself is the Lagrange multiplier for this. Correct enough here. So it will take care of this. Okay. So this this is this is what we do. So make a wave function. That's where and that's this is I heard a lot of students and even researchers. They do not develop this insight into developing a wave function. You should see a wave function in your mind, right? You should actually construct a wave function. That is where the real physics is, right? And then you can always do the mathematics. That that comes like this. Okay. Now let let us now. The way to do this is that if you hit a minimum, right? So you actually look for an approximate wave function. The minimum of I'm also writing it in a form that I'll be using later. Approximate edge psi approximate. Right? You look for the minimum. If you actually have the exact wave function, the minimum should be E0. Right? But we don't do that. I mean, because it's an approximate wave function, it will always be greater. And that can be proved. I'm not proving that right now. It's a very easy. But when you do this minimum, let us see what happens. If I'm trying to find a minimum, so near this minimum wave function, I'll fill this board and then take a break. I think that will be the D time, right? If I take the minimum wave function, then let me call that psi min and then change it by some delta psi. this and if I subtract that psi min, psi, psi min, right, it should be 0 up to the first order in delta psi. Second order will be positive because it has to go up, it's the minimum, right, to up to first order this becomes delta psi h psi plus psi h delta psi and I want this to be 0 under the condition <coughs> that psi is normalized. The change in the, the, the first, up to first order should be 0. Now if this was completely arbitrary if delta psi was completely arbitrary, then I would have that h psi should be 0. But now I have freedom. Because this is 0, I can have, can have h psi equals some constant times psi. Right? I could have some sort of a that thing, and that gives me the whole thing. So you apply a constraint here, you relax the constraint here. Okay, I have freedom. And so what you what you in mathematics what it is said is that you are actually minimizing with the Lagrange multiplier the 
the function. So what you minimize is actually psi h psi minus Lagrange multiply psi psi both are equivalent. It's variation. All right. So either way you can think. You can either think of it like this, or you can think of it like this. Okay, that's the mathematical way of thinking. This is whenever you get in trouble. I mean, you know, you just look at this and say what should be zero, what should not be zero. Uh, this will be particularly useful. This way of looking at it, when I talk about the cone sham potential being like Lagrange multiply. Okay. So, but both are absolutely equivalent. So what we do is we calculate this expectation value and then minimize it with respect to those z and z1 or whatever parameters are thrown in and that will give me an accurate wave function. Lower I go, go, go in the energy, more the parameters I have and if I have a good intuition of writing the wave function, right, with the proper boundary condition, I get a better and better wave function. And so, you know, if you're lucky and you can uh, vary, you know, 10,000 parameters, you can get very close to or as close to the true wave function as possible. So I'm told that now we take a deep break. Okay. We took any kinds of wave functions for the helium like system. So let me take the first one, which was e raised to minus z effective r e raised to minus z effective r2. And there's a normalization constant which becomes z effective cube over i square of y, I, I don't remember now. So in applying the variational procedure, right, what I'm going to do is calculate the expectation value of the kinetic energy minus z over r1 minus z over r2 plus 1 over R12 and minimize with respect to Z effective. In this case, it happens to come out to, we know the expressions for this, this is hydrogenic like wave function, so this comes out to be Z effective square divided by 2, the kinetic energy for a single particle, and this fellow comes out to be minus Z, Z effective uh, divided by. 1 is 1 times 2 electrons plus if you calculate the expectation value of this, it comes out to be 5 over 8 if I am not mistaken. Very effective. Okay, so you will see that there is this extra term because of the electron electron interaction. If, so now I have a red pen also, so if this term was not there, for example, right? And you minimize this part only, right? You would get d e by d z effective equal to zero. That will give me z effective equal z. So that I know is the exact answer if the particles are non-interacting, right? Now I include the other term. Then I do this, and I get. Z effective equals Z minus 5 over D. You see, it reduces. Ah, so that means your particles are now seeing less of the nuclear charge. That's one, this is a very famous calculation. This is done all the time in the standard textbooks. What is not done is the next one, right? And that is. If I take the wave function to be psi r1 r2, and I want to spend some time on this, is e raised to minus z1 r1, e raised to minus z2 r2 plus e raised to minus z1 r2, e raised to minus z2 r1. I'm not leaving the next term out, I may even include that. 1 plus and I remember I said you include as many exact conditions as possible. So an exact condition that the electron-electron near the electron-electron, there is a cusp, 
gives you that this coefficient should be 0.5. So I only two parameters, Z1 and Z2. Mm -hmm. By the way, this wave function was introduced by S. Chan Shaker. I'm going to call it Chan Shaker wave function. Okay? We introduced it for helium when studying cell uh, properties of you know, the leak spectrum and all that of helium. So now I have two parameters, right? I'll again calculate, I'll normalize this first so that I calculate the CN. I'll vary Z1 and Z2 and calculate the energy, which will come out to be as a function of Z1 and Z2 and minimize this with respect to Z1 and with respect to Z2. Both. And that will give me a value of Z1 and Z2. Okay, and energy. Since this has two parameters, slightly better, it gives me energies which are very good. Much better than that Z minus 5 over 16. Okay? But more important, so that is that is the, the, the getting the energy part. Now what this wave function does is there is a qualitative difference between this wave function and this wave function. That is what I want to spend some time on. Okay? You see this wave function, the first part, is a product wave function. Phi R1, phi R2. Ah, this cannot written in a product form. Do you see that? The first wave function was like this product, the Z1 being equal to Z2. This one is a symmetric combination plus an R12 term, so you cannot write it as a product wave function. Right? That means I am not treating electrons as moving in some sort of an effective beam, right? If first electron sees a charge Z1, the second one sees a charge Z2 less. So that fellow goes out, right? So it's like this, the picture I made earlier. Here's the nucleus. If the first electron is somewhere in this orbit, I'll make the probability distribution. The second one is outside seeing less of a charge, right? On the other hand, they can switch. The first electron sees less of a charge and the other one sees more of a charge, right? So they are correlated. They're talking to each other. They're saying, if you go, go close to the nucleus, I'll go out, right? One of them. And I cannot distinguish between electron one and two. Furthermore, they say, if we are farther away, we're better off. Nothing like that was happening here. Both were seeing some sort of an average beam. Right? So, this is what is known as the correlated wave function. It's a correlated wave function. Because there is an inbuilt correlation, there is an inbuilt property in this wave function that the position of one wave, one particle, determines the position of the other particle. Right? Whereas it did not happen in this. Okay? So any time there is an interaction, right? This correlation is going to come in. All the hmm? All the So R which is the. This is a correlation which is coming. Why is it coming? It is coming because of the electron-electron interaction. So I'm going to call it. Coulomb correlation. Right, so you see we have in made a wave function which takes care of the electron electron interaction in a manner that is that is consistent with what we think electron electron interaction should do. It should keep the two electrons far away, right? 
if one electron is close to the nucleus, other one goes farther out, right? And so on. Whereas this was more of both were seeing the same kind of thing. That's why the wave function was the same, right? So what I'll call this is kind of mean field theory. Let me go not call this. This, is this. In this electrons are seeing a mean field. In this I cannot write a mean field. Okay, the two are very different. This is qualitatively different from this. And this gives you lower energy. I can then keep building on further. For example, I can add another parameter here. For example, I can put an exponential v r12, where v is another parameter which I can determine further with the help of the computer. Right? This can get, make them go even farther out. They are more exponential. Right? So you can keep doing that. But the idea is that I have inbuilt terms which are R12. I have terms which cannot be written as product wave function. And this is the essence of electron electron interaction. Whenever there is an interaction, the wave function is going to have terms that keep the electrons apart, that make the electrons talk to each other. All right? And a wave function that takes care of that is a is, is, is better wave function. However, you also see that necessarily brings in, even just for a two electron system, two, three parameters here in a very simple wave function. So here there is one parameter. So mean field is always easier to do. Right? Correlation business is very difficult to do, and that's why you need computers to do it. For example, in the 60s, one of the best calculations for helium atom required about a thousand parameters. Okay? So that was a figure is uh, wave function for that. So, so, so I hope the idea of correlation is all right now. Whenever there is a R12 term, it will cause the wave function to distort or change compared to a single electron wave function. And that distortion comes about because that lowers the energy. If the electrons are farther away, they'll always lower the energy because their interaction, interaction, electron electron interaction energy will go down, right? So they'll lower the energy and that gives you better energy, that's a better wave function. And then it obviously has more effects, yes? For many electrons, how do you write this correlated wave? For many electrons, as I said earlier, what one does is takes the product wave function and throws in something called the Jastrow factors, which are pretty much like this. <coughs> All right, uh, those factors are such. I mean, uh, they they have certain value when the electrons are right next to each other, and then they go up. They become larger and larger as they go far apart, and finally they form. Okay, so they they kind of keep the electrons far away. That we can call no mean field. That is not mean field because it will. Okay, so let me write this. Let me just write a kind of since he asked. Uh, now, let's generalize this, so, let's take a homogeneous electron gas, right, and I have, let me still stick to uh, K1, R1, and so on, E is to I, K, and R, N, I've not anti-symmetrized this, and then I have factors like, 1 plus F e raised to, let's keep this 0.5, R12, one factor, 1 plus 0.5 e raised to B, R23, and all these combinations. Where is the mean field? You can't write as a product wave function. Right? Or I, I can even put it, uh, yeah, plus is fine. Then I can also put a factor that tapers it off. I'm just writing it schematically. All right. So, yeah. So you can you have to build it. I mean, you can come up with a better factor. You can do a better calculation. But that's the idea. Yes. In, in the, uh, the mean field approach, the uh, sum of the energy will give the total energy. But no, it will not. Okay. Remember, my energy in all this 
is given as the expectation value with respect to the wave function. Right? Now, what he is saying is that the energy will come out as sum of the energies. Right? It will not. Because in this case, what will happen is you will have, right now I have not introduced the eigenvalue, but I will come to that in a minute. I will plan to do that thing. But this, this is the energy and this is not equal to, I have not introduced the eigenvalues yet, so the question does not arise yet. Okay? Any other questions or comments? All right. Now, and this for the mean field theory. And what he said is, since electrons are, let's assume there is some sort of effective z, and therefore I can write the wave function psi r1 up to rn. So we are generalizing this as a product wave function pi i ri. And this product wave function is, uh, you fill the orbitals according to the Pauli exclusion principle, that is not more than two electrons in an orbital. And then the electrons, since this is a product wave function, the electrons satisfy a main field equation, some V external R plus some V electrostatic pi i equals epsilon r pi i. This is, this is the main field. All electrons see some sort of an average field. Okay, this is the proposal. Now, what this field would be, V electrostatic will be the electrostatic potential due to all the other electrons, then I. So, I will write this as summation J pi J R mod square. This is the density of all electrons except the I electrons. So, I will put a prime here at R prime divided by R minus R prime. Uh, prime, which I can also write as integral rho r prime minus pi i r prime mod square over r minus r prime prime. Notice that this becomes I dependent. I wrote that rho and you go to your book that is given, this expression for rho is given right on top. That's what I've used. Okay? Because phi is the probability of finding a particle. If I add all the probabilities, I get the density. Okay? So, and the wave function is a product wave function. This term, what it is doing is, it's avoiding an electron interacting with itself. So this is called, this term, the potential that comes from here is called self-interaction. I'm avoiding self-interaction. If I included this term, right, if I included this term, then the energy would go up. If an electron cannot interact with itself, we subtract this term. And you put it in, and then you solve it self consistent What it means is, I start with a set of approximate phi, right? Calculate this V electrostatic. From this, get these phi i's, and they need not be equal to this. There's no reason. Then you again calculate it, go back here, and you keep doing it until you achieve self consistency. That means the solution you are getting out give you a potential that give the same solution back. All right. Now let me is that idea clear? Yes? Let me illustrate that with this. That's why I kept it here. Then you can also der der derive this thing variationally. And I'll come to that in a minute. But first, let me explain how this problem can be solved exactly in a self-consistent manner. So in this problem, can I raise this now? 
in this problem, since we are doing field theory, what I would have, if I were to solve it using Hartley theory, would be I'll have for particle say two, I'll have minus half del one square plus minus z over r plus integration phi two r one square over r one r r dr. This is a electrostatic potential due to particle two. That particle one is c phi one equals phi one. That's precisely what I wrote earlier. This is the kinetic energy operator, the external energy operator. This is the electrostatic energy, electrostatic potential seen by electron one due to density of electron two. Right? R1. Yes. And there is an eigenvalue epsilon 1 on the side. Now we have taken the formula that phi is e raised to minus z effective. So let me write this as e raised to minus a r1 square root of a cube over phi. All right. Now let's just take this phi 1 and phi 2. I am not assuming a priori that this is a, so I am going to write it as p cubed over phi e raised to minus. I calculate the potential due to this, put it here, and solve. Again, these need not be the exact solutions of the self-consistent equation, but let us take them to be approximate of this form. So, I put it here, this will come out as B, right. So, I will have an equation H1, which is a function of B, expectation value with respect to function of A, and do B by dA equals 0. And this will give me A as a function of B. That will give me an approximate wave function of this form in terms of B. If the second wave electron had this wave function, the first electron would have this. And for self consistency, I would say A as a function of B is B. That's self consistency. <coughs> Finally, I should have exactly the same parameters for both, right? That's that's the main feature. So I solve this, assume A and B are not equal, take A as a function of B and then demand A B equal B. Okay? That gives me self-consistency and that gives me exactly the same result. Okay, so I'm looking at it from the variational point of view. I am looking at it from the Hartley point of view and both give me same results and if you calculate the energy, alright, if I calculate the energy here, now I have something new now here, epsilon i, right. Let us calculate the energy in terms of this. The energy Out to be. Let's just write, take the expectation value of phi 1 minus 1 half del 1 square minus z over r1 plus 1 over r12 minus the other term del 2 square minus z over r2 and then I'll take the expectation value with respect to the entire phi r1 phi r2 the whole thing right each phi would give me one epsilon here right plus epsilon 2 and then you have to subtract you find that you have to subtract 
the the term phi one r one mod square phi two r two mod square o one r one r minus r two d r one you actually overcome this so that's why that that doesn't come out to be equal it's not equal to epsilon one plus epsilon two when you do epsilon one plus epsilon two you can see that you will be over counting this by a factor of half <coughs> you have to subtract that so energy is not equal to epsilon one plus epsilon two these come as a grand multiplier okay so energy is not equal to the sum of eigenvalues because these are not non interacting electrons I'm making them. I'm treating them like non-interacting electrons, but they are not. So I have to correct for a certain thing. All right. However, when you solve for this using this mean field, okay, you still get a equals b equals z minus five over sixteen. You get it. still get the energy equals whatever. The same. So I this was a variation calculation. This was proposed by just looking at it. I should be able to get since I'm getting the same answer. I should be able to get this theory through the variation principle. Let's 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 do that. So if I have this Hartree wave function, let me call it H equals product phi one r one phi two r two and so on phi l r n. Let me calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to psi h. When you do that, okay, what you get is phi i del one square over two with minus sign. Let me write it i minus Z over or let's just write it as V external. This is a single part, part of the part of wave function phi i sum over i equals one through n plus summation i j one half i j prime prime means i not equal to j phi i. R mod square phi j r prime mod square over r minus r prime d r d r prime double. Let us look at each term. Right, this term is nothing but the single particle, whatever energy, kinetic energy for each particle. External energy for each particle, and I sum over all the particles. This phi i r square is the density of ith electron at r. Phi j square r prime square is the electron density of jth electron at r prime, and I'm calculating the interaction energy, and I'm avoiding i equal j. Okay. And now, what do I do variationally? Variationally, I minimize this. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to vary each phi. I'm going to take each phi to phi i plus delta phi i for each i. And demand that delta e be zero, with the condition that integration phi i r mod square d r minus one is equal to zero, and each orbital is normalized. If I do that, I'll again use the Lagrange multiplier technique, and you do this. I'll leave this as an exercise. It's very simple. It's just messy. You just have to do all that delta pi, delta pi, and all that. And what you end up getting is 
minus one half that is square plus v external r plus integration rho r prime minus i mod pi r prime mod square over r minus r prime v r prime acting on y i r exactly the same as Hartley equation, right? So whatever Hartley proposed, sort of intuitively, that I'll calculate the electrostatic potential of an electron that an electron sees by subtracting its own density from the total density, and that is electrostatic potential, right? And the rest of the Hamiltonian is this, and this is the answer. So we, yes? I can't hear you, so you have to take a mic. Can you? Mic, mic, no way. All the single particle uh, wave functions are orthogonal to each other. I have not put that condition in, right? I have not, but in certain systems, because this is only our part, when you solve it, you put certain constraints. For example, in atoms, when you take YLN, you take a central field approximation, they become orthogonal. But they need not be right away. But you can always make a canonical transformation to orthogonal ones. But also create some problems. Okay. But you can certainly put those constraints. But there, we did not put that constraint yet. Point of view, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Yes. No, no, come to that. But Manoj, actually, uh, the eigenfunctions of any Hermitian operator yes. they would be always orthogonal, but here the operator for it, Since this, this, this operator keeps on changing for each electron, they need not be orthogonal to each other. So, and if it is not, the same operator, then it is guaranteed that the solutions would be orthogonal because it's a, a Hermitian. This is also Hermitian, but the operator itself is changing. <coughs> but you, I, I, you can put that condition that brings in an extra term unnecessary. And always you have the Smith technique, you can do it, so but uh, this will create uh, other problems. Anything else? Okay, so this is also derived through right, uh, the, the, the variational technique. So you can see that variation technique kind of gives you a way of deriving the equation also. Now recall that this one point I had made was put in as many exact constraints, uh, exact conditions. on psi as possible. And that made the wave function better and better and better. Right? So you, it so happens that I can still remain within mean field regime. Right? I can still remain within mean field regime and make my wave function better. Okay? And we'll do that now. Alright? And that brings us to something called the Hartley Fock theory. I'm going to now write my wave function psi r1 and I'm going to include the s, the spin part because the antisymmetry of the wave function comes with respect to the total wave or total coordinates and so on, rn, sn, right? This wave function should be antisymmetric with respect to any exchange, right? And that's the next exact condition I'm going to put into the wave function. That can make the whole thing even better. Yes. 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 You're not. You're no, I'm going to. Okay. So I'm going to write this as 
an anti-symmetric combination of this product that we had, okay, and that you can write very easily as I'm going to write this as chi one R one S one chi two R two S two. I'll introduce that in a minute. Then chi uh, chi one chi two R one S one chi two R two S two and so on as a determinant all the way up to chi n R one S one up all the way up to chi n R n S n where S denotes the spin particularly Z component of electron and chi is the space part or time the spin part. Okay, let's write that as alpha. Okay, so I'm taking what are what are known as the spin orbitals, right? And I'm making an anti-symmetric product of this. It is still a product, but what I have done is I made taken all the combinations for an odd spin I have put a minus sign for an even spin I have put a plus sign and this is known as a Slater determinant. And what I have done here is satisfy this property that a wave function, an electron wave function. is anti-symmetric with respect to the change of two electron coordinates. Yes. Where? Yes. Yes. No. Even that Z effective electron that I wrote for the two electron, all I said was that I introduced the Z effective parameter, right? And I said Z effective somehow takes care of it. Even when we wrote the Hartree function, it was also I'm using main mean field. So no, it is not. I'm just trying to make a product wave function so that my life in solving things is easy. Okay, I have not introduced R12 term and I am seeing that now if I put one more exact condition does things, do things become better. The next step would be to put R12. Okay, so I am starting from a very simple product wave function and I am trying to make it better and better remaining within that mean field regime. No, no, so you're jumping the gun. Yes. I'm still remaining within product. Yes. I'm saying I still want to write the wave function as a product. I still want to have a mean field theory. And you want to go beyond that, then obviously I will do something more. But I want to remain within the product regime. And if I want to remain within the product regime, this is what I'm going to do. This is the best I can do. Beyond this, I don't have any exact more exact condition to satisfy. Till that you bring as now I'm going to write as Hartree Fock wave function. I've introduced one more thing, right? And now, how do I get these orbitals? I'm going to get them again through the variation of concern. Now, there are subtleties as to whether these pi's are the same, pi's are not the same, this is known as unrestricted, restricted Hartree Fock. I'm um, right now just assume that all pi's are the same for both, both up spin and down spin. Yeah, which is known as the restricted Hartree form. So, if you want to go beyond that, you can do that also. Twice later, on a theory of atomic 
I'm not getting the right and wrong and molecular structure. That is the best book I've seen on this. Uh, he explains everything very, very painstakingly. Okay? And beyond that, you can go to a book by Zabo and Austin. But this is just the space, the whole, whole, the whole business very nice. Another Stone Age book, written in 1950s, I think. Okay? Now, how you get these orbitals is by applying the variational principle, but before that, to do that, I have to calculate this expectation value. And I'll give you rules for calculating expectation value from a Slater determinant. Okay? So if you want to calculate a single particle operator, okay, which I'm going to write as O1, which is sum of these, let's write O1 R only, right? I R I. Basically made up of only coordinates of a single particle, right? Then the expectation value of O1 with respect to a Slater determinant, let me write this as Hartree Fock. So I have to Fock is given as summation I pi, or let's write this as chi, R I S I. Get it. <laughs> All right. Now, for each the single particle alpha or the spin wave function is the same. So, when you sum over that, you can that always gives you one. So you can write it as sigma and only the space part, i space, pi i, r, o, r i, pi, r. So the two particle operator, over two, which is sum of, let's write this as half, prime, i, j, G R I R J. Now let's write F for the single, right? And G for the number. I'm for trying to follow the notation. Okay, which is also a Coulomb operator. In Coulomb operator G, chi J, G R I R J, chi J, chi R. You get two terms. Okay? <coughs> now, this you can show, this is very easily, but this, this, this is the two terms you get, and then you sum over I and G. And there's a half parenthesis. 